Hey buddy Crow back again with another Evercade video. This time we're going to be looking at the last of the initial release cartridges. This is going to be cartridge number 10 for the Technos Collection 1. And this is for the Evercade, so if you're not familiar with what this device is, there'll be a link in the description below. You can look at that. That's where I initially picked this up and kind of gave my initial thoughts on it. As for the Technos Collection 1, this might as well just been called the Kunio Kun slash Double Dragon Collection because every game on this cartridge is related to either Kunio Kun or Double Dragon or, you know, both if you want to say those two series are connected as well because I believe that one of the games on this cartridge, Renegade, is actually the beginnings for both series. I may get into that a little bit later when I talk about Renegade, but in the Kunio Kun games may not be apparent because when they were ported over from Japan to the US and other countries, they went, underwent a whole bunch of name changes and everything. But the simple story here is that if it doesn't say Double Dragon in the title, it's a Kunio Kun game. The only exception to this Double Dragon rule is Super Spike V-Ball. This is actually tied to Double Dragon, but to see how it does, you'll just have to wait to that portion of the video. And it's also pretty apparent by the art style of the sprites and everything that, you know, the Kunio Kun games have this distinct art style. So we're going to be looking at all eight of the games on this cartridge. As usual, I'm going to give them all a ranking between one and five, a five being what I consider to be a great game, a game I thought was a lot of fun, very few flaws with it. A four being a good game, a game I still had a lot of fun with, but I there were a bunch of flaws here or there where if they were fixed, it could be a great game. A three is what I would give an okay game, a game I'm on the fence about or don't really care about either way. A two is what I consider to be a poor game, a game that I thought was kind of bad, but I could see some value into going back and playing it again. And a one is what I would consider to be a bad game, a game that I just wouldn't want to go back and play for any reason whatsoever. It's actually very rare that I give a game a bad rating. But, um, oh yeah, th and, and these rankings, they're all just based on my own personal opinion. I'm not trying to say this is a common consensus or anything, just based on what I've played and also what I how I've played it on the Evercade, not based on the original systems themselves. Basically me playing these games on the Evercade. So how's that for an introduction? So it's the same introduction as always. So let's just jump in to the first game on this, the Technos Collection 1. Game 1 is Crash and the Boys Street Challenge, originally released in 1992 for the NES, and this is a sports-themed minigame compilation much like Epix's Summer and Winter games or Konami's Track and Field games. The difference here is that the five events you take part in usually encourage you to attack your opponent in order to come out ahead. The events are as follows. The 400 meter hurdles where you can actually break through the hurdles and attack your opponent. The hammer throw, which also blends in the element of golf, since you are attempting to throw the hammer to the goal in as few throws as possible while trying to avoid the hazards. There's an interesting take on the swimming event as it's not about reaching the end, but instead about drowning your opponent before he drowns you. The rooftop jumping event is exactly as it sounds as you must either grab a pole to vault across the roofs or unicycles to speed across ropes tied across the buildings. And the final event is just a fighting scene, which is just a straight up one-on-one -on -one fight with your opponent. As you play each event, you earn medals based on how you place, and those medals can be used in between matches to buy power-ups and other items, which can be hindrances to the opponents in future matches. Now I'll just say at this point, I really don't like this game on the Evercade. The original game could be played with up to four players, but here you're stuck with playing only against computer-controlled opponents. Not only that, but I had issues with most of the events. The 400 meter hurdles feels way too fast and frantic to be played normally. I would just spin kick my way across the entire track and knocking your opponent off the screen just makes them fly right back at you where you are anyway. The hammer throw doesn't really offer a mini map or anything, so you really don't know how hard to throw the hammer to avoid the obstacles. And the rooftop jumping event doesn't give you clear warning as to whether or not you need a pole or a unicycle if you're given the option of both. On top of all that, it's also possible to do the best in an event, but still not come in first if an opponent managed to collect more medals laying on the ground than you did. 
It's the same for winning the game as well. You can win all the events, but if you spend all your medals on power-ups and items, then you won't win overall since your opponent may have saved more medals than you. I mean, I guess that's an interesting strategy to the game, trying to spend your medals sparingly so you have enough at the end to win the game. But ultimately, I didn't like how many of the events were handled, and I feel like there's too much of a luck element to collecting medals. So I'm going to give this a poor rating, although I would consider bumping this up a notch if multiplayer was possible. Okay, I normally like to talk about these games in the order they are numbered on the cartridge, but I'm going to skip the second game for now and talk about the third. And the reason for that is because the second game is Double Dragon 2, and I'd like to talk about Double Dragon beforehand, and that happens to be Game 3 for some reason. So, Game 3 is Double Dragon, and this is the NES version that was originally released in 1988, and this was an extremely popular game at the time, but truth be told, I never really played it before, so this is my first time really digging into it. As I already knew going into this, Double Dragon is a side-scrolling beat-em-up, but what I didn't know is that there's an RPG element to this game wherein you gain experience as you level up, and as you level up, you learn new techniques to use. What's funny is that your experience level is represented by hearts on the screen, and I initially thought that that was the number of lives I had, but nope. It just meant that I was opening up new and more powerful attack techniques and I hadn't realized it yet. And when I did realize it, I easily got more invested in the game. Now I definitely had fun playing this game, but I can't give it a great rating due to a few oddities. In the controls department, you have to hit A and B together to jump, and that's a bit awkward. But as you progress through the game, there are platforming areas where accurate jumping is necessary to not die, and I don't believe that should have been part of the game. Also, there's the beginner's trap of not realizing that some of the holes in the walls and doorways are meant to be entered, because if you don't enter them, the game will just let you continue moving right anyway and the level cycles over again. It's very bizarre unless I feel it's just the game letting you gain more experience before you proceed. There is a mode B to the game I didn't touch because basically it's just a one-on-one -on -one fighting mode, and that would have been a bit of fun with two players I suppose if the Evercade was capable of that, but the main attraction of the game is mode A anyway. In short, it's not a perfect game, but it's pretty damn fun. Double Dragon is going to get a 4 from me. Now that I've talked about Double Dragon, I could go back to the second game on the cartridge, Double Dragon 2 The Revenge, which was originally released on the NES back in 1990. Now this sequel is basically the same game as the original, with tweaks and changes made here and there. The best improvement though I feel is that the game plays much faster, and that makes the game feel more fun and less sluggish than the original. The buttons have been altered, as there is no longer a punch button and a kick button, but rather an attack right and an attack left button. That is to say, no matter which direction you're facing, one button will always attack to the right, and the other one will always attack to the left. Due to the faster pace of the action, I kind of like this change, as it allows you to attack behind you quickly without having to turn around. Unfortunately, jumping is still performed by hitting both attack buttons together. The other major change is that you no longer gain experience and learn new moves. I understand if most people would prefer it that way, but I actually liked that leveling up system in the original. It was something different that set it aside from the rest of the beat-em-ups and could affect the way you play the game. All that aside, it's practically the same thing. I was having a blast playing this game and I was thinking to myself that I might just give this game a great rating, but then it happened. The same thing that happened in the later stages of Double Dragon happens here as well. Jumps. Jumps that require successful maneuvering or it leads to instant death. Only it's much worse here with the inclusion of disappearing platforms and conveyor belts. This mixture of beat-em-up action and platforming just doesn't work well, especially when you have to hit two buttons to jump. Other than that, my only other nitpick has to do with the game defaulting you to the medium difficulty level, Warrior, only to tell you after you defeat the shadow of yourself that you can't fight the final boss unless you play Supreme Master Mode. I mean, it seems just a little silly to me that the default difficulty of the game won't actually let you finish the game. But it's mainly the platforming they threw in here that bumps this down from a great game 
to a good game. I'm giving this a four. Game four is Renegade, and this is the NES version that was released in 1988. And like the other three games I previously talked about, this was the first time I've played the game only knowing a few things about it. Mostly all I knew is that this was a beat-em-up, wherein the original Japanese version was the first in the Kunio-kun series. But the western release of this game saw a reskinning of all the characters and backgrounds to more Americanize the game, and while the Japanese version was the beginnings of the Kunio-kun series, the western version release of Renegade could almost be seen as a precursor to the Double Dragon series. And that's all I really knew, and being a game older than the Double Dragon games, I thought I was in for an inferior experience and I was pleasantly surprised to see I was wrong about that. The game controls are much like the last game I talked about, Double Dragon 2, in that one button attacks right and the other button attacks left, regardless of which way you're facing, and hitting both buttons together will do a jump kick. However, I think it works a bit better here, especially since it doesn't throw in the platforming elements like the Double Dragon games did. It really feels like it's you against the world in each brawl that occurs on the screen. The enemies will almost always try to surround you, making sure that you have to use your back attacks, and I thought it was clever the way that one opponent would try and grab and hold you, while another opponent would come and approach you from the front, and then you try to kick them, and then you'd shove off the guy grabbing you and then grab them, and then you could throw them into other enemies. And for an NES beat-em-up, I was pretty impressed with how the game played. There really is no side-scrolling to speak of, as you'll usually clear out a screen full of guys and then move on to the next screen. And for some reason, there's a motorcycle riding stage thrown into the middle of the game that's so easy that I'd almost consider it an intermission from the rest of the game. One thing that's missing here that we'd see in future beat-em-ups is that there's no weapons to pick up off the ground. However, there is a power-up here or there that'll appear that'll help you out. As you hit the later stages of the game, you'll have multiple paths to take, and unfortunately it's set up as a trap, whereas if you don't enter the correct door, you'll actually go to previous levels in the game. Now fortunately, I was using save states when I saw these doors, so I was able to negate such annoying traps and actually beat the game in less than 30 minutes. So yeah, it's kind of a short game when you know which path to take, but regardless of these shortcomings, I think I've got to give this game a 5. I thought it was great here on the Evercade, I wouldn't mind playing through it again. Game 5 is River City Ransom, originally released on the NES in 1990. This is a game I didn't really grow up with, but rather discovered it in the early 2000s and I instantly took a liking to it. It's another beat-em-up, much like the previous three games I just talked about, but the twist here is that it's also somewhat of an open-world RPG as well. Every enemy you take down drops money, and the more money you collect, the more items you'll be able to purchase in the shops scattered throughout the game. Eating certain foods will replenish your health and or upgrade one or some of your many stats. Purchasing and reading books will enable you to learn new moves to take out your foes easier. It's up to you if you want to press on forward with the game and take out the harder foes and more difficult bosses at your current level, or if you want to backtrack a bit, grind on easier foes, and earn more money for items to increase your stats. And if you happen to lose all your stamina, the game will usually just deposit you in the last mall you visited and you lose half the money you hit on you. And that's about it. The game is pretty generous in that respect. No game over, no losing stats, just a minor inconvenience of losing some money. But even so, with the Evercade save state feature, it's pretty easy to avoid this from happening. And if you're low on health, it's quite easy to just avoid the enemies for the most part and run to the nearest mall for some stamina boosts. There's only a few nitpicks I can complain about with this game. For one, the screen doesn't scroll until you're pretty close to the edge of the screen, so it's possible for enemies to just run onto the screen and hit you before you realize that. Also, in regards to purchasing items, there's no way to know what effect an item's gonna have until you buy it and use it. Well, no way unless you look up a guide for the game. So if you're new to the game, you're not going to know what items would be best for the amount of money you have. The last thing I want to mention is since the Evercade currently lacks the ability for two players to play, the two-player mode here is just out of the question. Despite those minor nitpicks, I've still gotta give this game a 5. It's a mixture of beat em up and RPG that works really well here, and the ability to save state means you can always resume your progress whenever you want without relying on passwords. <laughs> 
Game 6 is Super Double Dragon for the Super NES, originally released in 1992, and I was a bit confused about the name of this game when I booted it up because the screen first says Super Double Dragon, but then when you get to the title screen and for the rest of the game, the name changes to Return of Double Dragon. Did a little digging and found that this is a slightly modified version of the Japanese version of the game, which was called Return of Double Dragon. And it's not insignificant that the Japanese version is included here, as it turns out this is a more complete version of the game, which includes more areas and refined gameplay. I won't go into any more detail other than that, it's just a bit of information I found interesting. Now the first thing I noticed when playing this game was how choppy and sluggish everything felt. This game is definitely slower paced than the other games in the collection, but after I played for a while I started getting used to it. Gameplay here is made more interesting than the other games in the collection as well. Since this is a Super NES game as opposed to an NES game, more buttons are available. So not only do punch and kick get their own separate buttons, but so do block and jump. I also found it interesting that you could block a punch and immediately counter by grabbing and punching the opponent, and maybe even throwing them into other enemies. The major addition to this game though is the dragon meter. By holding one of the shoulder buttons, you can charge the dragon meter, and by attacking when the meter is at certain lengths, you can do different moves such as a spinning arm punch or a jump kick or waiting till it's over halfway filled and that will let you do this tornado kick that can span most of the screen. Letting the dragon meter fill up all the way will grant you more powerful basic attacks for a limited amount of time. The problem with the dragon meter though is that if you're planning on doing a tornado kick but accidentally charged a meter too much, you're all of a sudden performing moves that you didn't expect to and it can throw you off a bit. Also, you're stuck really not being able to do anything but move while charging the meter, so most of the game is then spent walking around avoiding enemies waiting for the meter to charge, and if not timed correctly, your attack may miss or the opponent may hit you, reducing the meter to zero anyway. You could just play without using the special dragon meter moves, but I found that tornado kick to be very effective for just about every enemy in the game. Not only that, but charging the meter isn't very difficult, as I found that simply moving up or down constantly will prevent enemies from attacking you, or if they do, they will just miss. It even works for the final boss in the game. All you need is a bit of patience. Now granted, this was all on the default game setting, so it may not work on a harder difficulty level, but having to wait to charge the dragon meter to attack, combined with how sluggish the game already runs, I'm going to give this one a score of 4. There were other little nitpicks I had as well, but those were the main issues that were preventing me from considering this to be a great game. Game 7 is Super Spike V-Ball, and it was originally released on the NES in 1989. This is a volleyball game wherein you select one of four teams, each with their own strengths and weaknesses, and play through a tournament in an attempt to come out the winner. It's really as basic as that. My first impressions of this game were rather ho-hum, and I felt a bit underwhelmed by this game. There's a button for jump and a button for hitting the ball, so at first the game felt like a bit of a slog. Serve the ball, the opponent bumps, sets, and spikes. You try and hit the ball, bump, set, and spike the ball back. Just continuing until a mistake was made on one side or the other. And then the CPU spiked the ball so hard at me, my character got knocked to the ground. I was like, wait a minute, how do I do that? I looked up a bit of documentation and found out by tapping the jump button before spiking the ball will charge you up for a super spike move. Ah, so it's not just a clever name. After a bit of practice, I found myself being able to do the super spike move pretty consistently. The fact that the Evercade has turbo buttons for NES games certainly helps. After a while, I found myself having a good time with this game. There's something really satisfying about hitting the ball so hard at the opponent that they get knocked to the ground. I was also pretty happy with the small variety of locations here as well. Certainly doesn't hurt to throw Chicago in there. As much fun as I was having with the game though, it's hard to ignore the fact that one of the original selling points of this game was the 4 player support with the at the time newly released NES 4 score adapter. This game would have really been a blast with 3 other people, 
but here on the Evercade, it's just a one-player affair. My initial thoughts were to give this game a three, but the super spike move really saves this game, and I gotta give it a four. Oh, and how does this game tie in with any of the others in this collection? Well, Billy and Jimmy from Double Dragon are playable characters in this game. The eighth and final game in this collection is Super Dodgeball, and this version of the game was originally released on the NES in 1988. And personally, I had fond memories of this game, as I remember it being a game my cousin had, and we would play it a few times, and I remember having a positive experience, despite not really knowing how to play. So it's been decades since I've actually played this game, and I was looking forward to playing it again, and wow, my memories of this game were quite different. Firstly, this is a dodgeball game that has the controls of a beat-em-up, without the punching. More like it's a beat-em-up without the punching, and there's only one item to pick up, and that one item is the dodgeball. One button throws and catches the ball, and the other button passes the ball and ducks. Hitting both buttons together jumps. Most of the fun from this game comes from getting the ball, running half-court, and letting loose a special attack which can potentially knock out multiple opponents. There are six players per team, but three of them are designated as the main players and the other three are relegated to the out-of-bounds area of the opponent's side. They're really just there to scoop up the ball if possible and pass it to one of the main players, but they can try and hit an opponent too if you want. Once the three main opponent players lose all their energy, you win. And I actually quite like how when these players run out of energy, they seemingly die as you see them turn into angels and ascend to heaven. If that was it, I'd say this is a good or even great game. Unfortunately, the NES is not the greatest console for this game. I found the game to be far too sluggish, stuttery, and glitchy to be as enjoyable as it should have been. Also, six players per team is way too many sprites for the NES to handle, and portions of the character and even the ball itself are constantly blinking themselves in and out of existence. It's really not something I could get used to. Also, as I mentioned earlier, I remember this game being fun for two players, but again, it's not something that's currently possible in the Evercade. There is a bonus game type thrown in as well called Beanball, but it's just a free-for-all version of Dodgeball that has the same problems as the main game. As it is, I'm going to have to give this a 3 and say it's just okay. The performance of the NES version of this game leaves a lot to be desired. And that's going to wrap it up for our Technos Collection 1. Eight games on the cartridge, and six out of those eight games I gave a good or a great score to. Four of them I thought were good, and two of them I thought were great, whereas one of them I thought was just okay, and another one I thought was poor. You know, games I probably wouldn't go back to play, maybe infrequently, maybe. N none of them were bad. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. If we were to average all those scores together on this cartridge, we're going to give it a score of 3.88, which really doesn't mean anything. <laughs> I'm going to stop maybe doing these averages every time I do a cartridge. And the next video I do on a cartridge is going to be the Xeno Crisis and Tanglewood cartridge, only two games on a cartridge, but it's not going to be the next Evercade video. Because the next Evercade video, I'm going to go back and relook at all 10 cartridges. We're going to rank the cartridges, or at least I'm going to rank the cartridges, because again, it'll just be my own personal opinions. And we're going to pick out my favorite game on each cartridge. So that's something maybe to look forward to. I don't know. I'm looking forward to making that video. In fact, I'm going to be making it right after I'm done filming this video. So thanks for watching. I'll see y'all next time. Bye.